And all of God's people said, Amen. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh upon us. So once again, we come asking for your permission to preach. Not to entertain, but to proclaim that you are the Christ. Use me and guide me. Order my steps in your word. Hide me behind the cross. Cover me in your blood. That they may see none of me, but Lord, all of you. I'm yours and you are mine. Use me as an instrument. Help me to play the tune of your choice. In Jesus' name we pray. If you believe in God, shout hallelujah in this place. Hallelujah. Come on, let's give this worship team a hand. We're still in our series, Defending Jacob. I think we've been here at least two or three months now, um, and I'm not done. I'm not done. I believe, I believe this could take us throughout the rest of the year, if need be. Um, and sometimes I just hear my spirit when I'm studying because in about six more chapters, we're going to run right from Jacob right into Joseph. And I'm wondering if there is something that the Lord wants to say. Uh, but for today, I want you to go to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, and I want you to go to verse number one. Genesis chapter 32, verse number one. And the Bible says, and Jacob went on his way. And the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is is God's host. And he called the place Mahaniam. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, unto the land of Seir, the country of Edom. And he commanded them, saying, Thus shall ye speak unto my Lord Esau. Thy servant Jacob saith thus, I have traveled, I have sojourned with Laban and stayed there until now and I have oxen and asses and flocks and men servants and women servants and I have sent them to tell my Lord that I may find grace in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and what we realize is that he's not waiting on you to come to him. He's actually coming to meet you, but he's not coming alone. He's got 400 men with him. You always know you're powerful when your enemy recruits. <clears throat> if you were nobody, it would be one-on-one. -on -one. But the testimony of your power is how your enemy recruits people to attack you. And like you and like me and like others, Jacob was afraid and he was distressed. So he started to divide the people that he had in his flocks and herds and camels into two bands. And said, if Esau come to one company and kills it, at least the other side will have time to escape. Let's talk about for anybody who lives in this time where everybody says, don't ever look back. 
Don't worry about it. Sometimes you have to. Today I want to talk about the purpose for going back. The purpose for going back. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <clears throat> there is a concept called, and many of you have heard this, just a concept called full circle. How many of you have ever heard that? Whenever you hear the concept of something being full circle, it is referring to a series of events that eventually lead you back to the place where you started. It would be like one of you in here grew up on the side of town, went off to be successful, only to come back and coach the local high school team or like the mayor of the city of Houston to grow up in what we call the 4-4, to go to Houston and be a legislator, excuse me, Austin, only to come back to Houston and be the mayor of a city that he ran for three times. That's a full circle moment. Um, a full circle moment is when life reminds you that you've been this way before. You may call it deja vu, you may call it coincidence, but every once in a while, God will give you a snapshot that reminds you that this is where he told you you would be. <laughs> every once in a while, a storm will come to keep you from getting to the other side. And that storm is designed to let you know this is the way you should be going. When I moved to Houston, Texas in 2008 or 9, I remember Hurricane Ike, thank you mama, 8, <laughs> Hurricane Ike had just hit two weeks earlier. I thought for sure that when I came into a city with bugs the size of mice, and everybody's refrigerators and couches and carpets were sitting on the street. I thought for sure, this is, this is not what the Lord wants for me. And I remember very vividly when I spent my $106 on my one-way Southwest ticket. Packed all of my stuff in my car because anybody who ain't got money, you figure out how to get it all here without paying for two trips. I had socks in the glove compartment. True story. And I said in the airport, when the flights kept getting delayed because of the floods, I said to an African gentleman in the airport, I said, there's a storm going on in Houston and it's all disarrayed and the church that I'm going to hasn't had power for three weeks. I think the Lord doesn't want me to go. He says, son, the storm wasn't Texas saying don't come. It was actually Indiana saying don't leave. Because sometimes the devil will put a storm in your future so you will run back to your past. Are y'all with me today? I want to warn you today, I really do feel like preaching. Jacob is coming back, back to Canaan. Canaan. That was just to wake you up. This was a full circle moment for him. Um, it's like the circle of life. Any, any 
Lion King fans in here, it's, it's the circle of life because the truth is we begin in the end and we end in the beginning. Did you hear what I said? We, we begin in the end and we end in the beginning. It doesn't matter if you are poor or rich, life is a circle. It doesn't matter if you are black or white. Life is a circle. It doesn't matter if you're a Democrat, Republican, Independent. Life is a circle. Somebody say life is a circle. Yeah, because we, we're typically, not in all cases, if we live long enough, we all die the same way we were born. You were born with little to no hair. And if you live long enough, you will leave here the same way you came. When, when you were born, you couldn't walk. And if you live long enough, there's some of you all right now, your knees don't work like they used to. The lower back has a way of announcing that you've lived yet another year. When you are born, you have no teeth in your mouth, and if you live long enough, you may have some, but they won't be the ones that God gave you. That part. When you were born, you needed your food to be soft and fed to you. And if you've ever seen an aging person in the hospital, it looks like birth being fed from a spoon with applesauce and intravenous water being dripped into your veins. Why? Because you live and die the same. In fact, the first intravenous moment you have was the umbilical cord. And now you leave with clear cords because truthfully, Barring any tragedy, and if you are allowed your four scores of ten, and by good measure another score, you will leave here. I remember burying Tasha's father, and, and Brother Washington was 92, 93 years old, and, and when I went into the hospital, I couldn't really understand what he was saying, but isn't that truth? When, when you're born, you, you, you really can't understand the language of a child because life is a circle. Life is a circle and you leave here in what you think is the end. It is actually the beginning and what you think was the beginning was actually the end because when you came into time, eternity ceased to be and now you must get back to the end in order for time to be over. Life is a circle. Jacob has left home and it took him 20 years to make a circle. See, all of our circles don't happen as fast as, they, as we want them to. It took him 20 years to get back to where he started. Jacob left home, remember, because Esau threatened to kill him. And his mother said, I want you to go to a place and I want you to find a wife. And so he leaves and he goes away. And after 20 years, he has to come back and face a person he knows doesn't like him he's not coming home like the prodigal son to a fatted calf and a robe no he's coming back to an attitude he's coming back to anxiety he's coming back to a grudge can you imagine how he feels and how many of you all know what it feels like to know you have to go to a place where you're not actually wanted where when you have to go where you are tolerated and not celebrate it. He's got to go back to a brother he knows that he has stolen the blessing from and he knows that he has stolen the birthright from and he's got anxiety and he's got fear inside of him but he must face it because life is indeed a circle. That's all an argument really is. It's two people going around in circles. Have you ever told somebody, I'm tired of going through this with you over because even an argument 
is a circle. And if you decide to marry a person, you got to give them a ring. That's really nothing but a circle. Isaiah says that God sits on the circle of the earth. Ask Jupiter who created it. She will tell you it was the God of the circles. Consult the sun and say, who is your architect? And the sun will tell you, I was introduced to the God of the circles. Ask the moon who created you. And she will tell you it was the God of of the circles because our galaxy is a circle. Every planet is a circle and even Saturn is a circle surrounded by a circle because he is the God. I, I wish you would hear me. He's the God. He's the God of, of the circles. So as Jacob is getting closer and closer to completing his circle, he is met by some angels and when he is met by the angels, I can imagine that he is full of fear and anxiety because the closer you get to your destiny, the more unstable you feel. That, that's what you feel right now. Whenever you're getting ready to do something big, there is something that happens in the pit of your stomach that doesn't happen when you're being lazy. Help me, Holy Ghost. So when you get closer to where God wants you to be, there is something that come over you. I don't know if it's chills. I don't know if it's, if it's fear. I, I don't know if it's the loss of appetite. But everybody in here knows that there is a signal that comes to you when you know you're getting close. I wish you could do this, but you don't have to touch anybody. Just look at the person next to you and say, I'm getting close. I'm getting close. He's getting close. And that's what you feel. That's why you don't feel comfortable around anybody. That's why the friends you used to hang around, you're trying to figure out, do they still fit? And, and, and they don't even know if they want to be around you. Why? Because the closer you get to where you're going, the more uncomfortable you are where you are. So he's leaving. He's leaving Laban's house. And he's made a U-turn and he's completed his circle and he's on his way back to Canaan where he is from. And like God did for Paul on the road to Damascus, he gave him a signal to let him know that this is the right direction. And all of a sudden, on his way home, he sees a host of angels. He sees a host, not one, not two, but a host. I'm getting ready to help somebody in here. He, the Bible says he sees a host of angels, and, 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 and Jacob says, oh, my God. He says, uh, I just saw something. He says, I know what it is. I know what I just saw. Uh, it's, it's God's host. It's God's host. Now, Jacob has no idea what Esau has waiting on him, but God does. Jacob doesn't know the frame of mind that Esau is in, but God does. Are you with me so far? He's on his way back and God gives him a host of angels. And even though he doesn't know what he's about to face, God knows what he's about to face. And God gives him a host. Of angels. You, you, waiting, on, you waiting on the punchline, aren't you? He, he, gives him, he gives him a host of angels. And when he sees these angels... The Bible says that he names the place where he sees the angels Mahaniam. He names the place where he sees them Mahaniam. Now, when, when I looked up Mahaniam, it means double host. Let's preach. God gives him a host of angels. He names the place Mahaniam, which means double host. And then Psalms 46 and 17 says that he is the Lord of hosts. So I look at it, Mahaniam, double host. God is the Lord of hosts. So the purpose of going back then, the first thing that God is trying to show Jacob is who Lord is. Don't miss this. Because we know God is bread. We know God is water. We know God is money. But a lot of people are not going around talking about he's Lord. Because when he's money, then you think that you can tell him when you need it. If, if he is healing, then you think you can cry for it until you get it. But when he is Lord, it means it doesn't happen until he says so. 
I'm getting ready to preach in here if you'll just help me out here. Because whenever you look in the Bible and you see the word Lord capitalized, it means Yahweh. And Yahweh means, Yahweh is not God's name. Yahweh is a title that actually means that he is the self-existing one. Which means that God does not need anything else to exist. He doesn't have to rely on anything else to exist. You need water to exist. You need oxygen to exist. You need shade and shelter to exist. God says, I don't need anything to exist. I am self-existent. In fact, you can never refer to God in the past tense. You can only refer to God in the present tense. That's why when Moses gave Pharaoh the message that God said it was time to let the people go, he was not told by God to tell them that God said let me go he told Moses to tell Pharaoh that I am said let me go because God is always in the present somebody say he is it is what Arthur Pink calls the isness of God. You can never refer to God as was. You can never refer to God as will be. He always is. He is bread in a starving land. He is water in dry places. He is still Ezekiel's will in the middle of the will. He is still Job's walking king when you get old. He is still the fairest of ten thousands. He is the alpha and the omega. He is the bright and morning star. He is the lily of the valley. Somebody shout God is. And when you find out he is, you'll start breaking down over what was. Yahweh, he, he is, he is, he is, he is self-existing. He relies on nobody. Whenever you and your spouse are getting ready to have a child and create. There has to be consent on both ends. But when God got ready to create, he did not need a woman. He did not need a, he did not need a shot. He did not need sperm or an egg. All he did was have a conversation with himself. Let us create man in our image and after our likeness. Why? Because I'm Yahweh and I am self-existent. Which means I don't need your enemy's permission to bless you. I don't need the economy's permission to bless you. I don't need your health's permission to heal you. I am God. And when I say it, that's what it is. And I don't know who I'm talking to online and in this room. But the isness of God has entered into the room. And God told me to tell you, whatever you need, he is. Somebody shout, he is. He is, he is. While you're looking for it, you're looking over it. Because God is a spouse when you're lonely. God is medicine when you're sick. God is the word. And the word became flesh. In the isness tabernacled among us. He is, he is, he is. He's the Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. He is the Lord. He is self-existing. God doesn't consult your circumstances to decide what he's going to do with you. That's why you made it through the pandemic, because he did not ask your boss if you could eat. He asked himself. I am God, and beside me, there is none other. He is the Lord of hosts. I might shout in the next five minutes. I'm just warning you, because I know what's coming, and you don't. He is the Lord, not just the Lord, cup of Joe. He is the Lord of hosts. Then that changes the whole thing because host in the Hebrew uh, is sabaoth, which means, listen, armies. Oh, God, help me in this place. Now, if you read the King James Version of the Bible, the Bible says that he shows him a host of angels. And now we are in the presence of the Lord of hosts. 
who is the self-existing one of armies. What does Esau have waiting on Jacob when he arrives? 400 men. Jacob doesn't know that Esau has an army waiting on him. So you think God showed Jacob angels so that he could worship? Partly, but not entirely. Because another way of saying Lord of hosts in English is God of the armies. So what God was showing Jacob is that your brother has an army waiting on you. But I don't want you to be fearful because I am Lord. Of the armies. In other words, God sent me here to tell you today that whatever you are facing, He's Lord over that. I wish I had about 500 people in here and about 2,000 online that would think about what you're facing today and begin to shout, He's Lord over that. Are you sick? He's Lord over sickness. Do you need money? He's Lord over resources. Whatever you need, somebody shout, He's Lord over it. God told him to tell you whatever you're facing, he's God over it. Whatever you're facing, he's Lord over it. He's the Lord over the armies. He said, Jacob, listen, when you get there, they're going to have a leader, but I'm the Lord. They're going to have a leader, but I'm the Lord. This is what God is saying. He says, they're going to have a general, but I am over the entire army so that even when the army has been formed against you, no army formed against you shall be able to prosper because I am the Lord. If you got that in your spirit, you would never worry about another enemy. If you got that in your spirit, you would never worry about another jealous boss. If you got that in your spirit, you would never worry about another hater. Why? Because whoever hates you still has to answer to the Lord over the hate. I am here to tell you right now that God loves you so much that he is the Lord over everything that hates you. Somebody shout he's Lord. Somebody shout he's Lord. Lord over the angry, Lord over the jealous, Lord over the envious, Lord over the everything. Whatever you're facing, he's Lord over it. That's why we don't lose. Not because we know how to fight. We don't lose because whatever's fighting us, he's I can't understand it because if I was telling you right now that a million dollars was coming your way, you'd be shouting. You'd be shouting about the money. I'm not going to shout about the money. I'm going to shout about the Lord because if I ask the Lord, he'll make blessings, track me down. Goodness and mercy shall follow me. Somebody shout his Lord. The reason why God wants you to look back or go back or have this full circle moment is because he wants to show you that no matter what stage you were in, he was still Lord. Even if you were in sin, still in the birthright, he's Lord. Or even if you're working and Laban is not intending to keep his word, he is Lord. No matter if you got to lift the rock up that's too heavy for you, he is Lord. If you'll look at Jacob's life, God was Lord at every step. And the moment you find out that he is Lord, you'll stop stressing over everything. The Bible doesn't say the battle is God's. The battle isn't Jehovah. The Bible says the battle is If you'll just stop fighting and let him be Lord, when Pastor Raymond was up here talking, I looked at Pastor Torres and said, I'm about to run out of here because he's already in my sermon. You'll give him glory, but you won't give him battles. God says, I want your fight and not just your faith. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give your enemies to me, give your cast your cares. Yeah. 
your stress is connected to your inability not to be Lord. Come on now, y'all got to help me. If you are honest, your biggest problem is you think your strategy will work. And you will run over God to try to do what you are used to. Come here, Moses. Show them what happens when they try to get the future by using the past. The reason why Moses was not able to enter into the promised land alive is because he struck the rock when God said, speak to it. And if you keep striking and not speaking, you won't get into the promised land. And by the way, let me tell you, if you read your Bible and get to the book of Hebrews, you will find out that Moses did eventually get to the promised land, but he was dead when he got there. You got a choice, either walk into Canaan or be carried in. And if you keep on trying to be Lord, they're going to carry your dead body into the next dimension because you are trying to be Lord. God says, release it and let me be God. How many times have you said to somebody, just let me be me? If it's important for you to be you, then how much more important is it to let God? Do you know how frustrated God is that y'all been married all this time and you ain't let him be him yet? You've been worshiping him all of these years and you haven't let him be a provider yet? You have been worshiping him all of this time and you, letting, you haven't let him be the Lord over your armies yet? Who am I talking to in this room? Who am I talking to online? Raise your hand. You are stressed because you're trying to do God's job. And the problem is he didn't equip you to do it. You don't have that kind of power. You can't change the way people think. You can't get ahead of the path and stop what an enemy has planned. But you can let him be Lord. I have seen God kill my enemies. I have seen my enemies in the hospital with cancer. Because I let God be God. Remember this. Anything you kill... The blood is on your hand. But if the Lord, if the Lord does the same thing to a person you want to hurt, then it is the will of God. Our problem is we don't know he's Lord. And how do we think we qualify for the job. We were not there when the light came on for the first time. You were not there when water became wet. You were not there when birds began to fly. You were not there when animals began to trot. You were not there when the darkness and the void was emptied by the feeling capacity of Yahweh. You were not there when God started time ticking, ticking, ticking while still maintaining eternity at the same time. You were not there when he split himself into past, present, and future because he the one is, was, and is to come. You were not there when he stayed in heaven on the throne, put himself, wrapped himself in flesh, sent himself down through 42 generations, wrapped himself in the seed of Joseph and came out of a 14-year-old named Mary while still maintaining the Holy Spirit in eternity's past. Why? Because you were not there. Why? Because you are not Lord. And if you miss creation, then you should not have any participation in what's happening next. He's Lord. I could really quit there, but I ain't, but he is. He is Lord. The first reason he has you going back is to find out he's Lord. The second reason he sends us back is because he's trying to teach us how to heal. I could almost guarantee 
that you are sitting next to somebody who is still wounded because they haven't let him be Lord. They're bleeding on you right now. You don't see it. They're sitting next to you. They hear me, but their mind is still in their trauma. How many of you have ever been in church and you go in and out of church and trauma? Church and trouble. You miss 50% of the sermon because you're trying to be Lord. <laughs> you're on the phone texting and, 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 and adding up your bills through the message, trying to figure out when you get paid what you're going to move and do all of that instead of just for the next hour, just let them... Because what if I told you that in the next nine seconds he was going to work it out anyway? What if I told you that a miracle was coming anyway? And what if I told you that if you get in the way, you're going to mess up the way? Because he is the way. Let me get out of here. He sees the host of angels. And now he knows why he needs them. Because the, the God of armies, the Lord of the armies, has now sent him a signal that he is Lord over what he's facing. Help me, Holy Ghost. And when he gets there, what we understand through study is Jacob has already sent messengers ahead of him to try to see and test out where Esau is. Because, see, you know when you're dealing with folks who are crazy, how many of y'all got a way of figuring out whether you should or should not say to somebody that you're close to? Because you know how they're going to be, so you got a way of kind of testing them out. How you doing today? Fine, all right, this ain't the day. Let me... <laughs> so he sends a messenger ahead to find out what kind of mood Esau is in. And, and I'm getting, oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, this is so good. I don't know what to do. Let me see. He, Jacob, he gets the message. He tells Esau. He says, all right, messenger, tell Esau. This is what I want you to tell him. He says, um, since I've been gone, I kind of want you to know I ain't the same person. I know what I did in the beginning was wrong. I know I stole your birthright, and I know I stole your blessing. But if you can believe me, I want you to know that God's been working on me. See, I got out there and got used myself and find out what using somebody feels like. Because you see, sometimes the only thing that can change a person's opinion is experience. And while you're trying to change the behavior of somebody who's doing you wrong, just be patient enough and let God be God. He'll put them through something that would allow them to understand your perspective. It may take 20 years. They that wait. I'm not the same person. I'm, I'm not who I was. I, I, I left here broke, but can you see how successful I am? I'm coming back with flocks, and, and, and I left here single, but dog, I got four women now. Oh, yes, he's got two Handmaids and two wives that he that's pretty successful. <laughs> How he get all of them to sing in the same choir? That is some work. <laughs> Jacob is a player from the Himalaya. He got four women following his crazy butt. And 12 kids. And they ain't got no sprinter. They walking. If a woman rides with you, that's cool. But if she walk with you, oh, y'all ain't hearing me. If you tell a woman, we going out to eat, and you pull up in your Rolls Royce, that's the, but if you say, baby, we going to Steak 48, and it's about a four-mile walk, and if she say, come on, baby, you done did something. I don't care what you say. 
Most of us would be like, you go ahead and walk. I'm an Uber. I'll see you when you get there. I know what I did was wrong. All right. How many of y'all ready to learn something? How many of y'all ready to learn something? I'm getting ready to teach you something. All distractions stop. Put your phone down. Look me in this TV. Look me in my eye. Put them pancakes down. I'm about to teach you something. <laughs> Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 4 says that if a spirit rises up against you, shh, yielding pacifies offense. Not fighting, <clears throat> not plotting, not planning, not figuring it out. Yielding pacifies offense. The word yield in the Hebrew is marpe. Listen. So yielding doesn't mean stopping in the Hebrew. Yielding in the Hebrew means to heal. Pacifies means to put to rest, which is why when you're trying to put a baby to sleep, you give him a pacifier. So he says that whenever the enemy is rising up against us, healing puts the pain to rest. I'm getting ready to help you. Why? Because most people wait on the event to be over before they heal. Ecclesiastes 10 says, when you heal, then the pain will end. Y'all didn't get it. I got to come down here. See, most of us who have been offended, we're waiting on an apology. And when we get the apology, then we'll think about it three or four days. We'll finally get over it. And then we'll heal little by little. I'm going to feed him with a long handle spoon, but I'm going to be careful. And I want to get myself hurt again. And so we heal little by little. And the reason why the anger never leaves and the reason why the blessing never comes is because the Bible says that healing pacifies the offense. In other words, whenever you're hurt, you heal. And then God deals with the hurt. Yielding pacifies offense. The reason why for the next few weeks we're going to see the blessings that came over Jacob's life even though he was dead wrong is because he healed first and the offense stopped second. And whenever you wait on the event to be over before you heal, you are showing that you're actually more immature than the person who hurt you. Because the person who hurt you is already over hurting you. So they get over their part faster than we get over our part. And the Bible says that healing pacifies offense. You have to heal and that solves the problem. I know it was good because y'all ain't saying nothing. I want you to think of the most pain you've ever been through. The one you keep on praying about, right? You know, that thing that's in your journal six times. The thing that you keep typing in your notes. The things that you hold so guarded in your heart that you don't really tell anybody the full story because it would be embarrassing to admit what you thought about as a result of that hurt? God says, heal. And then that'll solve the problem. Pastor, you don't know what they did to me. Heal. You hear me, sister? Heal. He left me. Heal. And that solves the problem, I was abused. Heal. 
Now, healing doesn't mean that it's going to be supernatural. Sometimes you need to go lay on a couch and spend $125 an hour and not get a few purses and shoes and haircuts and chains and watches. You'd be surprised how much you could cure if you cared less about how you looked. For some of us, our healing is on our wrist. For some of us, your healing is on your forearm. For some of you, your healing is in your garage. You spent the money you could have healed with trying to dress up the wound so that you won't look like what you've been through. But I'd rather wear the same outfit every day and be healthy mentally than to be walking around a dressed up fool. How many of y'all know you need to heal from something? You gotta pray about it. You gotta seek counsel about it. You gotta read what the word says about your infirmity. And when you heal, it solves the problem. The reason why God sent him back to see Esau is because there is no better way to find out if you are healed than when you face the person who caused the hurt. And when you can look at the person who caused the hurt and not require an apology and not require money, and not require a payback. Just, I'm so healed that I don't even remember what you did, and if I do, I don't have any desire to make you hurt like I did. Somebody say, I'm healed. The other day, Shawnee and I went out to eat, and we sat at a table with a lady her current husband, her ex-husband. See how y'all do? See, that's the problem. See, I'm, you think I'm, you, she is the most happiest, wealthiest, gregarious, healthiest looking woman at her age that I've ever seen. Her husband is in his 80s and they drive around town doing whatever they want to do. Why? Because they ain't still mad at their ex and they can sit at the table with their current wife and their ex-wife. You don't divorce a person to still be mad at them. I divorced you so we could be happy. Hello, somebody. What in the world? I'm going to sit around here mad at you still. We broke up so we could smile. I'm healing you whether you know it or not. At the table is this woman, her ex-husband, her current husband, all of her children and his children, and the table was a blast. Why? Because it was a table full of healed people. You weren't telling me, I can't be in the same room as him. Ten years later? Come on, y'all. If you're going to keep that kind of animosity and that kind of connection, you might as well stay together. Can't raise a child still mad at somebody you broke up with? That causes confusion. See, I don't like you, you don't like me, but we love them, so let's come together and show them health and not our issues because healing pacifies offense. Who did I just teach something to? I think I'm going to let y'all go in a minute. I, I'm the one that got to preach again. You ain't got to do nothing. Go to Sunday fun day. So just hold on. The mimosas is going to be there when you get there. And if they don't, go online and get a recipe. Pre-game and then go. 
<laughs> he just said, you talking good. I don't know if he's talking about the pregame or the word. I'm just trying to figure out <laughs> which one of them. But whatever you get out of this, bless your soul. <laughs> Goes back. Sarge, he's healed. You, you tried to kill me, but I didn't come here to try to kill you. I came here to let you see that even though I was in danger, I doubled. <laughs> Cody, the boy left with nothing. He came back. He left with nothing. He tried to kill him. He's been on the run for 20 years. But he comes back with enough animals to offer Esau 580 as a peace offering. He offered him 580 animals. He's got 11 children, four wives. He left in danger, but he came back doubled. You'd be surprised what your storms do to you. You be surprised what your anxiety is building in you. You'd be surprised what God actually has in this crisis. If you would heal, you could double. By the time the person who hurts you sees you again, you won't be in the same condition you were in when they hurt you if you heal. If you don't heal, they're going to look at, well, ooh, ooh, 20 years been rough on her. <laughs> Have you ever seen somebody 20 years later, you'd be like, whoo. Hey, girl, how you doing? Fine. You look great. Okay. <laughs> then you get with your friends, be like, ooh, Lord, Jesus. She look rough. Time been hard on her. Grief ages you. You see people walking around and they're young and, and they're vibrant and you're trying. What skin products you using? It's called forgiveness. I buy it right from heaven. I apply it every morning and it works great on my heart, my skin. Anybody want some forgiveness? It's free. I told y'all before that forgiveness is the only medicine for pain that you can take that has no side effects. He healed. He healed. He was wronged, but he healed. He was afraid, but he healed. And you'd be surprised how some of you, how mad you are about something that ain't even got nothing to do with you. You're mad about your problems, and you're mad about somebody else's problems, and the rest of us are upset because things didn't turn out the way you anticipated, but life has no obligation to reward you with what you didn't speak up about. <laughs> if you wanted something, you should have said something. Most of us think we're so cute, we're just going to sit back and let life work out. Whatever, you're right about that. We're just going to sit back and just let everything come to us. Jacob had to go back, Reverend Adams, to initiate this thing because Esau was never going to come to him. This is your life. This is your happiness. Do you want to be made whole? 
Because if you've been laying on the bed for 38 years, you won't walk until you pick it up. Must Jesus bear the cross alone? And all the world go free? No. There is a cross for you and a cross for me. A consecrated cross I must carry until death has set me free. If it is nothing that life has taught me, it is my job to be made whole. If you stay mad, you're using 50% of your brain power. And life is hard enough when you got your whole mind. You don't want to be walking through this thing with half of it. The longer you stay angry, the more you delay your deliverance. Can I tell you, Jacob finally says, all right, let's do this. He sends his children ahead across the river. And now he's by himself. And all of a sudden, the Bible says, a man comes and begins to wrestle with Jacob. What we are witnessing in the scripture is what we call a theophany. This is a visible manifestation of God. Examples of a theophany would be the burning bush. Another example of a theophany would be the pillar of a of a cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that led Israel through the wilderness. These are theophanies. These are visible manifestations for God to let us know that he is real. Jacob is wrestling with an angel. He's actually wrestling with God. And the Bible says that the angel touches his hip. His hip pops out a socket. Jacob is now limping but still holding on to the angel. His heart is broken. He's facing an army. He's sent his children away. And his hip is out of socket. And the Bible says that he wrestles with God to the break of day. He wrestles with God so long that God says, Jacob, let me go. I've been fighting with you too long. Jacob said, Lord, do you know how long I've been waiting on you? I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. And I don't know who is in this room today. But the Holy Spirit has come in, and I don't know who's online, but the Holy Spirit is in this moment. I dare about 300 of you to reach up and grab them and say, you can't leave this room until you bless me. You can't leave this room until you bless my children. You can't leave this room until you bless my wife. You can't leave this room until you bless my business. You can't leave this room until you bless my life. You can't leave this room until you bless me with an idea. You can't leave this room. I don't want to leave. Until you bless me. My question for you is will you let a limp and what Laban did keep you from leveling up? Or will you decide if I got to get it limping, if I got to get it crying? If I got to get it depressed, if I got to get it frustrated, 
If I got to get it with anxiety, if I got to get it confused, I don't care. I am not going to let this moment pass me by until I get the blessing. How many of y'all are waiting on a blessing? I want you to stand to your feet. I want you to grab a hold of this moment. And when you're asking God, why do I have to keep going through this over and over and over again? God is saying, because I'm trying to show you I'm Lord. And I'm trying to show you how to heal. But if I could tell you one more thing, the reason why I have you face to face with this crisis is because I'm trying to teach you your name. He said, Lord, I ain't going to let you go until I get what I came here for. God said, Jacob, your name shall no longer be Jacob. From this moment forward, your name shall be Israel. In the middle of the most difficult moment of his life, is when the change actually came. If you stop this fight, if you stop this battle, if you stop this healing, you're going to stop before your name changes. Right now, your name is depressed. But if you keep on praying, your name is going to be liberty. Right now, your name is loser. But if you keep fighting, your name is going to be victory. Right now, your name is sick. But if you keep on praying, your name is going to be healed. His name was Jacob, which meant trickster. God flipped the script and named him nation. And now, since he's Israel, his sons go from being sons to nations. Because if you don't heal, all you have are children. But if you heal, they become nations. Most parents don't recognize it is our hurt that holds our children back. Oh God, I wish I had some. If you don't get over what their father did to you, they'll never get over what their father didn't do to them. If you don't get over what her mother wasn't, then you treat her or him according to the disdain that you have for someone else. Most parents don't recognize that we keep our children from becoming nations because we hold grudges. You're still mad at that preacher and you don't even go to that church no more. You're still upset with a high school sweetheart and you've been out of high school 25 years. Somebody said more than that. Whatever, add the years up. Who am I talking to in here? I'm going to let you go, but I'm just wondering who am I ministering to? How many of you know that God wants to change your name? How many of you know that he wants you to be whole and, and he wants you to produce and, and he wants things to come out of you? Lord, it's the lighthouse and we're not going to let you go until you bless us. Whether we're on YouTube, whether we're on Facebook, whether we are on the app, the earth is the laws and the fullness thereof. And God, we are going to sit in this moment until we get the blessing. We're going to sit in this moment until you change our name. We're going to sit in this moment until we find out that you are Lord. We're going to stay in this moment until we heal from all of our infirmities. Oh my God. Over the next 25 seconds. How many of y'all seen this on TV? There is something called the Wounded Warriors Project. And you have to give to warriors that have been wounded in battle. Right now, I want every warrior who's ever been wounded in any battle to raise your hand. All right. Well, then over the next few moments, the same way we give money for wounded warriors, if you are a wounded warrior, money won't do in this moment, but you can give a praise. And over the next 50 seconds, I want everybody who's ever been wounded by anything 
to begin to offer God a praise in this place that is commensurate to value to the healing that you are expecting. If you need a little healing, give him a little praise. If you need a medium healing, give him a medium praise. If you need a big healing, give him a big praise. But if you need a great healing, a great God deserves a great praise. Open up your mouth and begin to give God praise. He was about to break every chain. Somebody say, I'm no longer the same. Come on and lift up your voice and begin to give God a praise and a voice of triumph. Somebody shout. I'm no longer. Hold on, that was cute. That was, that was all right. If you needed $20 to get gas. And that was cool if you needed $128 to get center point this month. But some of y'all got generational curses that need to be broken. No, no, I ain't talking about no gas money, Warner. I, 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 I'm not talking about no bill money. I'm talking about shackles being broken. I'm talking about chains being broken. I'm talking about curses. Open up your mouth. Yeah! Come on and open up your mouth and give him praise! Hallelujah. I'm no longer. Listen, I'm gonna give about 30 of y'all because I see something about to happen in this area. And I believe somebody needs to go on and shake the devil off. So I'm gonna give you about 30 seconds to go and give your God some praise. Open up your mouth. Shout until hell gets nervous. Shout until demons tremble. Shout. Shout. Follow me on this. Now, some of y'all saying church is supposed to be over. But remember, Jacob said, I ain't going to let you go until you bless me. Give your neighbor a high five and shout neighbor. The beginning of service was the first quarter. The middle of service was the second and third quarter. And that praise you just gave was the fourth quarter. But now it's overtime. And the next point wins. I dare somebody in Lighthouse today to begin to praise God like your life depended on it. Praise God like your children's future is on the line. If you don't mind, lift your hands and shout this out. Say, Lord, come see about me. I ain't gonna let you go until you bless me. Reach up and grab it. Reach up and grab it. Reach up and grab it. If you believe, I told you I felt like preaching. If you believe that God is in the room, wrap your arms all around him. And shout the Lord, I got something that I need you to handle. I got somebody I need you to handle. You handle it, and I'm going to handle the praise. Uh, you handle it, and I'm going to handle the praise. Don't worry about your bills. Handle the praise. Don't worry about the devil. Handle the praise. Lift up your voice. Open up your mouth. Lift up your voice. Open up your mouth. Lift up your voice. Open up your mouth. And shout, yeah. 
100 people over here, about 50 people over here, about 500 over there to forget about your trouble. And I want you to say, to repeat after me, say it like you mean it. It's over now. It's over now. Uh, it's over now. Anybody believe it's over? Oh, yeah. If you believe it's over, shout it, yeah! somebody one last time most of y'all have front loaders for washing machines and dryers but I come from the old school sometimes you have to put it in from the top and you can start the cycle with the lid still open how many y'all remember those they were always white and when you turn it on the cycle says Now what you must understand, it ain't the soap that releases the stain. It's the cycle. The agitation that releases the stain. Sin has left a crimson stain. If there's anybody in here that has been stained by life, Stained by your circumstances, I dare you to turn around three times. And on the third time, I want you to repeat after me. On the third time, I want you to say uh, every time, every time I turn around, I turn around. He, keeps on he keeps on blessing me. Blessing me. Yeah. I turn around. He keeps on blessing me, blessing me, blessing me, blessing me, blessing me. This is a new season for you. It's a new season. It's a new day. Yeah. A fresh anointing. 
I told you don't let them go. And it's coming my way. Ooh. It's a season of power and prosperity. Yeah, yeah. It's a new season. Make it personal. And it's coming to me. It's a new season. If you believe it, just wave your hands. It's a new day. A fresh anointing. Come on, make it personal. And it's coming my way. Yeah. Oh, it's a season of power and prosperity. It's a new season. And you've been watching it happen for everybody else. For 20 years, you've been in pain. For 20 years, you've been left out. For 20 years, you've been on the other side. But it's coming. God. To you, yeah. I believe it. You know why I believe it to you? I've seen him do it. I have seen him do it. There is no way. I can live without him. Neither should you. If you're in this place today and you've been in these cycles by yourself, it's time to break the curse. Okay, you got to heal so you can double. I know what it is to hold anger for a sustained period of time. And I study the Bible. And I can find myself gripped by the thought and it won't release me. Then I start applying tactics and thoughts only to be exhausted with waiting on the outcome everything I've turned over to the Lord he has given me beauty for ashes if you're in this room today before you can get the blessing of Jacob you gotta have the blessing of salvation very quickly if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior or if you allow this pandemic to make you think that you can forsake the assembling of ourselves. I want you to say, you know what, God? I know what life was like without you, and I know what life is like with you. I like it with him. Last time we met, people came from everywhere, and I want to see if God is going to do it again. If you're in this room or if you're online, they're getting ready to put instructions up. And you want to accept Christ, or perhaps you want to say, I want to, I want to join this place. This is my place of fellowship. We're going to be back here on the third Sunday for our anniversary. We're going to be back here on the third Sunday for our anniversary. All of the locations are going to come together. We're going to have one service together. By the time we get here on the third Sunday, you want to be in the family. I want you to come from wherever you are. 
I want to join this church. I want to give God my life. This is where I want to fellowship. Whatever it is, I want you to pray for me. Whatever it is, come from the balcony, come from the back. Walk down. God bless you, my brother. Somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else. Somebody else. Will there be anyone? Don't be ashamed. They're still coming. Lighthouse, come on, make some noise. Make it a big deal. This is nothing to be ashamed about. You're changing your life. We are family. God bless you, my sister. God bless you, my sister. Lighthouse, I want you to clap with the thunderous sound. Let them know how welcome they are. God bless you, my brother. Online, if you're watching me, you can do the same thing. You can do the same thing. We'll contact you the same way. We'll care about you the same way. We'll see about you the same way. God bless you, my sister. All right. Everybody say they're still coming. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see a young man coming too. Come on, praise God for that young man. Two of them. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you, sisters. Come on, y'all. Come on. If they can walk, we can clap. Come this way. I just want you to make them feel comfortable. It's a hard thing to come up here. It can invoke so many emotions and nerve, but if people are clapping, they feel so comfortable saying, I'm walking into a, a welcoming place. God, we're welcoming you. We welcome you. God bless you. Thank you so much. The Bible says when we clap, we summon angels. We summon angels. Angels are walking with you. Angels are walking with you. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. God bless you. They're still coming and God is still able. God bless you, sister. Hallelujah. Thank you, man. Thank you. Come on, sister. Come on. Hallelujah. Is anybody else? Man, life is a journey. You don't just arrive because you want to get there. You have to arrive because you kept going. You didn't quit. Finish your circles. Finish your cycles. God bless you, brother. God bless you. And I know some of you all are watching, some of you in here saying, I'm not going to come because I, I know what I'm going to do when I leave here. I, I, ain't, I ain't quite ready to just change my whole life like that. So I don't want to be a hypocrite. See, this is one of the things the devil gets in your head, that you got to have everything together before you join church. No, maybe remember I said heal and then the problem starts. Join and then the Lord will work on you. You, you, don't, you don't have to go home tomorrow. And you, you probably got plans to do everything that you would always do. And guess what? That's fine. Because everybody in here did the same thing. But one day a conviction will come over you. God bless you, my sister. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. And the reason why we struggle is because when I grew up in church, we used to be convicted. The problem with the church today is everybody's offended. You don't be offended by this. This is conviction, and it happens to all of us That's when good. the Holy Spirit sits on the church. God bless you, family. God bless you. Y'all ought to make them feel welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. God bless you, my sister. They still coming. They coming. They still coming. Don't y'all mess around and make us have to build another sanctuary in the pandemic. Hallelujah. They're still coming, guys. They're still coming. The day of Pentecost doesn't have to come. 50 days after Easter, it can happen every Sunday. All right, we good? Man, I've been watching you all day. Now I can quit. Come on, bro. You're the one I'm waiting on.
brothers. Women do it all the time. But let's stop seeing other brothers in trouble and rely on our masculinity in replace of our humanity. Hug that man. Cry with that man. It's cool. You good. You're still going to be you when you finish. It doesn't take anything away from you to show what's on the inside of you. You good. Lord, dismiss us from this place. Not from your presence. We trust you. You are Lord. We are healed. And we know our name. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody say amen. Wave to somebody on your way out. Tell them I love you. Ain't nothing you can do about it. I love y'all. I'll see you in two weeks. God bless you. this message to someone, someone needs to hear it. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just want to say thank you just for the word that was given. We pray that someone's heart was touched and someone's mind was changed. We love you, God. All these blessings we ask in your son, Jesus' name, amen. Hey, remember, we love you here at the Lighthouse Church. Nothing you can do about it. See you soon. What's going on is PK here. And listen, I want to tell you that I get so many DMs, so many messages of people saying, Pastor, how can I connect with you? I love your messages, but going through YouTube is kind of difficult. Where can I come to a centralized place? We heard you, and that's why we created Lighthouse 2.0. Lighthouse 2.0 is our tribe. It's our village. It's the place where all of the people who say, I want PK to be my online pastor, and PK says, I want you to be my online member. This is the place where we go, the watering hole, the ecosystem, where we all come to grow together. And it is exclusively for you. They're getting ready to put a link up on the screen right now that shows you how you make that exclusive step. And everybody can't get in. So you better take first mover's advantage and get in while you can fit in. I can't wait to see you inside of 2.0. May God bless you. And let's do this thing for Christ.